brothers and sisters, dear friends, first of all, I have to apologize for my uh, weak English because when I listen to all these uh, beautiful uh, talks, I, I am I'm aware how poor is my English. You, you will remark it soon. Um, it's now 10 years ago. It was on March 27th of 2008, an unforgettable moment. We were in Jerusalem. Some cardinals, some 40 bishops, good number of priests, lay people, together with the founders of the Neocatechumenate Way, Kiko, Carmen, and Father, Father Mario. Unforgettable moment on this Thursday of Easter week in Jerusalem. And the place is absolutely unique. It was in the upper room in the cenacle. And by uh, surprising permission from the Israeli authorities, we were allowed to celebrate Eucharist in the upper room, which is a permission very rarely given. Um, so it was a, not only great emotion, to, but a, a, a mysterious moment to celebrate in the Easter week at the place where the Lord celebrated his last supper with his disciples and where he appeared on the evening of Easter day. And uh, the room where the event of Pentecost took place. We were gathered at this uh, sacred place and I had the privilege to preside the Eucharistic celebration and to give the homily, the, the, to preach. Uh, you can imagine the emotion of this moment. I had prepared a homily, uh, but what came out was completely different. When I began to preach, I felt something I had rarely had in my life. I had the impression that the Holy Spirit was very much at work and I had to say words which I had not planned to say. Uh, I had no prepared text. I spoke in Italian. Uh, so, uh, and now I... In, it was transcri transcribed after uh, the, the, the celebration and the text was, without my knowledge, uh, went into the net and was widely distributed in different languages around the globe. And I want to deliver again this homily in a shortened way today. Ten years later, that was 40 years after Humane Vitae. Now it is 50 years after Humane Vitae. And uh, when I have finished with my homily, I will try to ask a similar question that uh, our president has uh, asked in, in his uh, very impressive address we have just heard. Uh, I want to ask the question whether there is hope, whether there is hope given the dramatic situation we are in. So I try to give you my homily again uh, in a different circumstance. We are not in the upper room. Yes, it is an upper room. It is a beautiful hall. Uh, the Holy Spirit is at work and, and I ask uh, the Holy Spirit to, to be with us and to strengthen us to receive what I think 
I had received to say at that moment 10 years ago. I want to say something I carry in my heart. I think it is a word of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that I have to say. What is the uh, sin of Europe, the schuld, how do you say schuld? Uh, the, the guilt. What is the guilt of Europe? The guilt of Europe, the main guilt of Europe is its no to life. Some days ago I spoke at the Austrian television with the question uh, of a journalist who asked me what is going wrong in Europe. And my answer was, Europe has three times said no to its own future. The first time in 1968, we celebrate now 40 years of this event, in my homily, through the refusal of Humane Vitae. The second time in 1975, as the abortion laws uh, flooded Europe. The third time, the no, third time a no to future and to life was just yesterday. It's all from my homily. Yeah. Just yesterday, we had in Austrian television the news that the government has agreed to homosexual marriage also in Austria. That's the third no. That was 10 years ago. And this, I said in my homily, is not a, primarily a matter of morals. It's a matter of facts. Europe is dying because it says no to life. I have in my heart to say the following. Precisely on this place where Jesus said to us that we receive forgiveness of our sins, remember in the Cenacle, in the apparition on Easter Eve, the first word of Jesus was the power of forgiving sins. Uh, I think that this is a sin of us bishops, even if we bishops present in the cynical were not bishops in 68. Today in Germany, for 100 parents, 66 children and 44 grandchildren, for the German population. That means that within one generation, the German population without immigration will be half of what it is today. We have said no to Humane Vitae. We were not bishops at that time, but it were our brothers, bishops of that time, we have not had the courage to say a clear yes to Humane Vitae. There was one exception. The then Cardinal of Berlin, Cardinal Bench, Cardinal Meissner, his then success, successor, was present at the uh, this Eucharistic celebration. Cardinal Bengsch had prepared a text for the German Bishops' Conference, a text of prophetic clarity. But this text disappeared in the Schubladen, in the, yeah. Uh, and instead of that, 
was published, the Königsteiner Erklärung, which has weakened the Catholic Church in Germany to say yes to life. There was another exception in Krakow. A group of theologians under the guidance of Archbishop and Cardinal of Krakow, the beloved Pope John Paul II, has written a memorandum and has sent this text to Pope Paul VI. I think that this witness of a bishop of the Martyrs Church under communism, the silenced church, had more weight than all the expertise that Pope Paul VI had asked for about this question. And that the courageous decision he made, Paul, Paul VI, by publishing Humane Vitae, which caused him terrible solitude. This text of Krakow, I am certain, ten years ago I said it as a supposition. In the meantime, we know that it is, it is true. This text of Krakow had helped Pope Paul VI to have the courage for Humane Vitae. Then I continued in my homily. Then there were two mad people in Spain who in the barracks had the courage to say yes to life. I mean mad in Christ, Kiko and Carmen. To say yes to Humane Vitae against the mainstream, and what a powerful stream it was. I remember the publication of the Spiegel, the German magazine. In the title was a photo of Pope Paul VI with a pill in the hand. It was a montage. Yeah. And with his no, he was ridiculized. But from these two mad people, mad in Christ, has come out a reality which is not, which cannot be denied. A reality as real as the demographic collapse of Europe. I mean the families of the neo that way which give in our Europe the witness that Paul VI had right, was right, that life is the greatest gift of God and that yes to life is a condition for real life. It's the condition for a living Europe. But we, the bishops, we were like the apostles behind hidden doors out of fear, not of the Jews as they were in the Senegal, but of the media. And of course, also because of so much opposition among our own faithful. We did not have the courage. In Austria, Maria Troster Erklärung, in Germany, Königsteiner Erklärung. And this, I said 10 years ago, and this has weakened the sense for life in the people of God. This has discouraged to open to new life. And when the wave of, of, of abortion came, the church was weakened because she had not learned this courage of resistance, which we have seen in Krakow, which we have seen with Pope John Paul II during his entire pontificate, 
this courage to say yes to God, to Jesus, at the price of despise and ridiculization. We were behind closed doors out of fear. And I think that even if we, actual bishops, have not been bishops at the time, but we must uh, repent for the sin of the European Episcopate, the Episcopate that had not had the courage to support Pope Paul VI with all his strengths. Because today we carry in our churches, in our diocese, the power, the, the, the weight of the consequences of this sin. Then I went on referring to the day's uh, uh, lecture of the Acts of the Apostle when Peter says to his audience, brothers, I know that you have acted unknowingly. You have acted unknowingly. You have acted out of ignorance. And I added, if we had known the consequences of this no to life, we had not said no to humane vitae. We would have had the courage to tell our brethren, be confident, trust in life. But we haven't had the courage. I know, said Peter, that you have acted out of uh, ignorance, you and your leaders. But God has fulfilled what he had said through the, the mouth of all the prophets, that through the suffering for which we are co-responsible, the suffering of the no to life, we know that through this suffering there is a way for redemption. We know, I said, through many confessions we hear as priests, as bishops, how great is the pain that the sin of abortion causes in lives and how great the sadness of a life is when it is filled with the no to life. We are co-responsible for the sadness of Europe. What did Peter say to the Jews? Convert and change your life. Convert and change your life so that your sins may be forgiven, so that the Lord will let come for you a time of cons comfort. Which is the comfort for Europe? Is there a comfort for Europe? In my homily I said, I tell you my experience as a bishop, a poor sinner, I see the families of the neocatechumenate way, of the communities, people through, who through the catechesis have the courage to change their lives because two mad people in Christ have begun and encouraged people to go a way of conversion. Today, in the midst of the European desert, there are families. I see the fruits of these families, not only of the neocatechumenate way, which I addressed in my homily. I see the fruits. And I spoke about the seminary, uh, Redemptoris Seminary in, in our diocese here in Vienna, which existed already. It was founded the same day as ITI. Yeah. In, interesting coincidence. Uh, the 1st of October, 
I signed the Foundation Act of uh, the Redemptoris Mater Seminary. Why do we have worldwide so many vocations in the Redemptoris Mater Seminaries? Because there are families. Because we have, through the communities and through these families, the experience of fatherhood, which is the condition for priesthood. And I added in my homily, I come myself from a family with many divorces. My parents and my grandparents were divorced, and my two brothers went through divorce. I know the reality of divorce. divorce. But where shall we learn priestly fatherhood when we do not have the example of fatherhood in families? Here I see how our seminarians of the Redemptoris Mater seminaries, they have 112 seminaries throughout the world in the meantime of Redemptoris Mater seminaries. Um, we have the example of these seminarians who learn their responsibility as future priests through the contact with the families, through their own experience of families, uh, and through uh, the shaping of the personality that goes through the families. And at the end of my homily, I said, at this sacred place, I ask the Lord that he may enter through the locked doors as he did at Easter, and that he gives us the courage, even if the last 40 years we, the bishops, had lacked courage to say yes to life. Uh, we have not say, said enough clearly this yes. We thought we have not the strength to do it. And we will ask the Lord when he enters that he may pardon our lack of courage and give us the strength that he gave to his disciples on Easter Eve this, in this sacred place where we now are. That was, my brothers and sisters, the homily uh, I gave 10 years ago and which came over me as a surprise. I didn't expect at all to say these words. Now to come to an end, we, we are 10 years later. How do I see myself? How do we see what is going on? I am convinced today that what I was, so to say, asked to say in this moment ten, 10 years ago is substantially true. It is the truth. What I would add today uh, is a compassionate look at those people who suffer the consequences of the threefold no to life. And of course we have to widen our perspective when I see the young generation today, how difficult it is to, to, to start a family uh, with the so often precarious life situations, uh, the professional difficulties, the, the stress, and even the exploitation uh, by uh, so many for, for which, which is this, the sort of so many young people whose job conditions, whose life conditions are difficult. 
But is there a remedy? Is there hope for healing? And I would end with three points that give me hope. Because as Christians, we never, never can lose hope. Because the Lord is risen. It is true, first of all, to say in a realistic way, as Pope Benedict used to say, we have no guarantee that Christianity in Europe will be saved. Asia Minor, today Turkey, was entirely Christian. It is today entirely Muslim. North Africa was entirely Christian. It is today entirely Muslim. We have no guarantee that Europe will escape uh, from what is a reality that many in the Islamic world consider Europe as a mature fruit for a takeover by Islam. It's a fact. And we have not to blame them because they are convinced that they do something good according to God's will, doing so, taking over. But there are points of hope. And I will give you three points. The first is what happened to the Roman Empire uh, when the decline of the Roman Empire by very similar causes than the decline of Europe today opened the Roman Empire to invasions of the so-called barbarians. But these barbarians, these tribes coming from Asia, the uh, Indo-German tribes that repopulated uh, the demographic void of the Roman Empire, they became Christians. Entire tribes converted to Christian faith. For many centuries, uh, they were, most of them were Arians, and it was a long battle to make them real Catholics. But um, Conversion is a, a great hope, and there is a great movement of conversion. Christ is at work in so many hearts, and that's the reality. Last year, we had in Vienna more than 200 baptisms of Muslims. Uh, in all of, all of, you, uh, of Austria, there were more than 600. And to say, to this year is the same number, approximately. Um, they, uh, their conversion has m many reasons. Uh, one reason is always the Bible. They meet the Word of God, fascinated by the Bible. Movies on Jesus. Movies on Jesus. Fascinated by Jesus. Meeting Christians, small house communities in Iran, thousands, thousands become secretly Christians because they meet house churches where they uh, discover Jesus, the Word of God, and the Christian community. And very often, the experience of a direct uh, apparition of Jesus. Many tell in their stories that they have had a dream where they saw Jesus, who encouraged them and who called them. So the first hope is conversion. And it's even the hope of conversion of us 
ancient Christians and even bishops may convert by God's grace. The second motive is, uh, and here I must quote my beloved text of Pope Francis on marriage number 123. It's easy to remember Amoris Laetitia 123, 123, where Pope Francis gives us what is for me the strongest encouragement against all the misleading tendencies in our actual world. And uh, Christian has quoted the, the words of Jesus, but in the beginning it was not like that. The Creator's plan. Creation is the strongest ally of Christian view of marriage and sexuality and family. The creation is our ally. Remember the vision of the apocalypse when the woman in chapter 12 uh, who had carried a child and brought to birth the child, she was persecuted. God gave her a place in the desert to be secured. But the dragon swapped a float of water to kill her. But the earth opened and devoured this flood of water to save the church. Creation comes to help God's holy people. Creation is the greatest ally of, um, of what Revelation tells us about marriage and family. And therefore, I want to quote just one sentence of Pope uh, Francis of number 123. Uh, the lasting union expressed by marriage vows is more than a formality or a traditional formula. It is rooted in the natural inclinations of the human person. Those who study at ITI know from St. Thomas the importance of the natural inclinations. Nature, human nature, speaks about reality. And the natural inclination, the examples Christian has given us, so, so speaking, 80% one to, to be what they are. I'm sure that much more than 80% one to be what they are, a man and a woman. Creation is our greatest ally and the natural inclination will always overcome all these ideologies. Imagine Soviet communism has disappeared like a nothing, leaving terrible traces of wounds, but vanishing into nothing, like uh, the statue in the prophet Daniel that, of which remains only dust. National socialism, the Nazi regime, the Nazi ideology disappeared just like dust. Yeah. But truth remains because it is rooted in human nature. It's rooted in God's creation, the natural inclination. And the third reason why we have hope In a secular world, we are not secure, we are not sure that we can win the battle, the battle on the public field, uh, in the public debate. The mainstream is so powerful, the uh, one government after the, all, after the other gives in about so-called same-sex marriage. Uh, uh, 
uh, never speak about same-sex marriage, yeah? only same-sex union, yeah? because it's not marriage. Uh, uh, and we have very often as Christians the impression that we are, uh, we have to, to f reduce the front, uh, step back, yeah? as in German, uh, in, in, the, in the Second World War, the Nazis spoke about Frontbegradigung. That was a euphemism to say, uh, well, we, we have still the front, but we have to reduce it. Yeah. We, we have to step back again and again and again. And we lose one battle after the other in the public field. And sometimes it's so discouraging. We see it in the ICLN, in the Parliamentarian Initiative, how these valiant Catholic parliamentarians in their parliaments fight for the truth, for human nature, for natural law, and so, of, so often are defeated. But, but we can trust in one thing which is always more powerful than all what we can all battles we can lose is the example. I know a family quite well known in this, in this assembly, but I don't give the name. A family whose, through the simple fact that this family is open to life, that they have children, has encouraged at least three young uh, couples to open themselves for life and to say yes, say yes to children. It was not the teaching of the church. It was not what they heard in the media against uh, our view of marriage and family. It was the sheer example. And Saint Paul, the, Saint Pope Paul the VI said this very, very famous word in Evangelium, uh, Evangelii Nunciandi, in his last encyclical on the announcing the gospel, he said, today people prefer to listen to witnesses than to teachers. And if they listen to teachers, they listen to them because they are witnesses. So what gives Real hope is the simple witness of Christian families and their life. Unpretentious, uh, just their example. This is, I think, the securest way to promote also the teaching of the church living examples. Saint Francis of Assisi said, preach to everybody the gospel, if necessary, even with words. If necessary, even with words. This, my dear friends, to conclude, is also the reason why we need ITI. Thank you. Thank you.